Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this day two of our Great Lakes road trip. We are here today in Ottawa, a little bit chillier than our destination yesterday, standing on the banks of the Ottawa River. And I'm here today with Dr. Stephen Cook from the Cook Lab at Carleton University, our special guest this morning. Um, Dr. Cook, welcome and thank you for being with us. Thanks. Um, so Oh, go ahead. Pleasure to be here. We're really happy to have you. Before we continue, we just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are situated. All right, and so today we're on the traditional lands of the Algonquin peoples. And in fact, exactly right here where we are standing is a very important place for the Algonquin peoples. In fact, this is where they would have fished for, uh, for food and ceremonial purposes uh, and have done so for millennia. And this is where we're fortunate to live, work, and play. So welcome to my office. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, now to those who are watching, the students, the classrooms who are watching live, just a reminder that at the end of our program, uh, in about 15, 20 minutes, we'll be opening up the floor for questions for Dr. Cook about our topic today, the American Eel. So teachers, you can access the application to ask questions. It's padlet.com slash Michelle and Olson slash Q and A. And there's a link to that in the email that you would have received yesterday evening. So we look forward to answering your questions shortly. So Dr. Cook, I guess to uh, get us started, what is, you mentioned that this is your office. Yep. Uh, what is it that you do here right. in Ottawa? So I'm a fish biologist, so I study fish. I'm also a professor, so that means I like to teach people about fish and share my excitement, my enthusiasm and knowledge with others. And this is a, a really interesting place where we're standing. We've got Parliament Hill in the background, so the nation's capital. We have the Supreme Court. We have uh, National uh, Library and Archives Canada. And then right behind us, this water that is behind us, this is the mighty Ottawa River, one of the biggest rivers in Canada, very important. Uh, it's uh, used for transportation, it's used for recreation, and uh, it's also used for generating electricity. Fantastic. And today we're actually going to be talking about one of the fishes that lives here in the Ottawa River. Uh, this is a fish that we talk about often in our Great Lakes program, and that is the American eel. Yeah. So could you introduce us to this incredible species? Absolutely. So I'm going to start off and show you this fish. This is not an eel. <laughs> Okay. But when you think about a fish, this is probably what you would think of. If I asked you to draw a fish, you would draw something that looked a little like this. Okay. What I want to do is show you an eel. Now, I do not have a fancy eel with me. So what I'm going to do is show you something that looks like an eel. And it is this. Okay. This is just a piece of tubing from a hardware store. This is what an eel looks like. Okay. They are thin. They're they are long, cylindrical, almost snake-like, but they aren't snakes, they are fish. And so this is about the size of an adult eel. When they're about 20, 25 years old, they'll be this big, so a little longer than a, a meter. And you can imagine how they swim through the water, sort of in a very snake-like movement. Now they do have fins, you can't see them on here, but they have some tiny fins, and they have a mouth, and mouth and eyes just like other fish and they also have scales now they're very very tiny scales so tiny in fact that that when you touch them it doesn't feel like they have scales at all it feels like uh, almost a little bit little bit slimy uh, but yeah that's that that's my eel and we've got some pictures that we uh, we can show you as well here now, the reason we don't have any live eel is uh, first of all they're an endangered animal so there's not a lot of them and at this time of year you can see here there's still a little bit of ice some ice in the background the eels are are not easy to catch so I would have to spend a lot of time trying to catch you one eel to show you so we've got some pictures we're going to show we've you got as the well pictures. so we're going to bring the camera in nice and close so dr cook this is a, a yellow eel right right so this is a picture that was taken by one of my friends sean landsman who's an underwater uh photographer and a scientist and so this is a picture of an eel underwater and you can see some of those tiny fins that it has on the side there and then it, it's its mouth is on the tip very much like on its its snout and then some some tiny eyes okay and i have another photo here bear with me 
All right, here we go. So same thing. Um, what does this photo tell us about the eel's habitat in a river? Yeah, so when eels are adult, and so that's an, an adult eel, they, they like to use pretty shallow water. So we'll find them in a couple meters of depth, and we tend to find them in areas that have muddy or rocky bottoms and a fair amount of vegetation. And so there you can see, some of you might think of it as being seaweed. Uh, the, the fancy word is aquatic macrophytes, but it's basically the, the plant life in and along the shorelines, and that's where they like to hide. And in fact, during the day, they tend to burrow into the mud and, and hang out in these really weedy areas. And it's only at night that they really come out and start moving around. So they're, they're nocturnal animals, meaning that they're, they're active at night. Right. Um, so we, like I said, we do talk about the American eel, uh, those of us who work for the Great Lakes Program, a species at risk, a species of concern. Um, and there are just so many incredible things about them. And one of them, one of those incredible things, is the journey that eels take throughout their lives. So not only traveling through their life cycles, but this incredible migration. Are you able to tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. And I'm going to do it. I brought my... I have three children and I borrowed their atlas All right, here we and go. we're going to go here. So this is a map of the world and so there are about uh, 80 different species of eel in the world. We're talking about the American eel. So there are eels that, that actually live in all sorts of different places. But we're going to talk about the American eel which lives. Here's North America, here's Canada in through here, here are the Great Lakes and the Ottawa River is about here. So this is where we're standing today, okay? Um, the American eel lived throughout this area. So this is where we can find the American, American eel. Now, as was mentioned, they have a really, really fascinating uh, life story and it involves a lot of move, moving. Um, they swim quite the distance. So let's start with where the, where the babies are made. So the adult eel come together in an area called the Sargasso Sea, which is somewhere between Bermuda and the Bahamas, just off the coast of Florida. So about here in the Atlantic Ocean, okay? So this is in, in the middle of nowhere, okay? Think big ocean, think really, really deep water. The water there would be a kilometer or more deep. And then at, uh, um, when, the, and when fish reproduce, we call that spawning, so the female would lay eggs and the, the male fish would fertilize them. Those eggs float in the ocean until they hatch and then they spend about 80 days sort of just circulating in the currents here uh, and at, at which point they metamorphose and turn into towards the St. Lawrence or whichever river they're heading towards. So we're talking about, okay, on this map, it might not look like very far, but we're talking about several thousand kilometers, maybe 2,000 kilometers, so it's really quite the distance. They migrate upriver, and at this stage they're only about this big, okay? So they're they're really quite, quite tiny. And so it's an amazing journey for an animal so small. Right. When they finally make it into areas such as this, large rivers or lakes like Lake Ontario or Lake Erie, uh, they spend 15 or 20 years growing. And so that's where they grow to be the size of the, the piece of tubing that I showed you before. But a, a meter length. Once they mature, that's when it's time to head back downstream, back down the St. Lawrence, out towards the Sargassum Sea to make more babies. So that's the, the life cycle of the, the eel in a, a simplified way. That's they're really quite, quite fantastic animals. I mean, what an incredible migration, right? Yeah. Um, especially when they're as tiny as you said. I actually do have a photo that you supplied us with of yeah. You said they were called... These are called glass eels glass that eels. you'll see in, in the photo. And they're, you can see why they might be called glass eels and that you can see right through them. They're almost transparent. Uh, they're tiny. Those are uh, about this long. So about as long as your, your index finger, your pointer finger there. Um, and uh, that's a stage where uh, sometimes people catch them and they'll use them for fishing bait. And then they'll also catch them and bring them into aquaculture and then grow them up to be uh, to be adults. Okay. Uh, so what 
at the Cook Lab, at your lab at Carleton University. What kind of work are you doing with the American Museum here in the Ottawa River? So, uh, what you can't see <laughs> is just over in that direction is a dam. And in fact, there are a number of dams on the Ottawa River and on the St. Lawrence River. And dams are not friendly to eel. Okay. So you can imagine if you're an eel that's this big and you've been swimming from the Sargasso Sea and you're trying to get to uh, this area or upstream into a, a lake to feed and grow, all of a sudden you're swimming and you hit a dam. Hmm. So you have to figure out how to get past that dam. You're a little fish and there's a huge dam. So how do you do that? So uh, one of the things we do is to help figure out how to get fish past the dams. And you might've heard of fish ladders. Yeah. So we essentially create stairs for eels to help them get past. Now eels are different than other fish. So you might be familiar with salmon and salmon are good jumpers, right? So we can literally build stairs that they will jump up. Now eel on the other hand they tend to be they like to squirm right they're they're kind of snake like so for upstream passage what we do is create these these uh boards that have little sort of uh, knobs on them and the, and they get in there and just kind of snake their wow. way up so that that's half the story that gets the babies to where they need to eat and grow and become adults so now you're an adult eel and it's time to go make more babies and you now have to get downstream. You're going to hit the dams again. Mm -hmm. But this time, when you hit a dam, you're going to potentially get sucked into the turbines. And so the turbines are what are, mm -hmm. are basically blades that turn and create electricity. And we all use electricity, right? So the cell phone that we're using to film today is powered by electricity. The lights in your classroom, your toaster, all of those things require electricity. So we all use electricity. And one of the ways we produce electricity is with water through hydroelectricity. So, so dams are important. We, we use them, but they aren't necessarily the best for fish. And because eels are so long, it's really hard for them to, to snake past uh, the turbines. So they oftentimes will get hit by the blades and then they literally get chopped in, into pieces. And so uh, that happens quite frequently at, uh, at dams. And so we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to guide eels to safe passage. Because there's ways around dams that are safe. So how do we get them away from the turbines and into those safe paths so they can continue on their journey and make it back to the surface? The Chaudière Dam here, which is in the background here, uh, there's all sorts of different pathways that people have to get into. So we can use things like lights and bubbles, Um, so we're coming up here. There are a lot of questions flooding our Padlet, uh, so I want to make sure we have time to answer some of those. Uh, Christine, what kinds of questions do we have from Dr. Cook? Can you tell us why? Okay, so just a little bit difficult to hear, but the question is why are American Eagles uh, so, since the 1970s, the population of American eels are down 99%. Okay? So, that's a, that's a lot. Uh, a few years ago, in, they counted uh, as few as 8,000 of these coming back. There used to be millions that would, would come back each year. Um, so, it, dams are the, the primary reason, and uh, both on the way up, making it difficult to get to, spot, to, uh, to feeding grounds, and especially on the way out. So, you've lived your whole life, you've gotten to be a big eel, you're ready to go make babies, and you try and go through a turbine, and boom, you're cut in half. Uh, it's impossible to go to get to the Sargasso Sea. So uh, certainly hydropower, um, but we also do a lot of habitat alterations. We change shorelines right. and some of those areas that, that we looked at before, those vegetated areas, uh, near shore areas, a lot of them have been developed. So it might be docks or it might be concrete. Mm -hmm. And so we're taking away those areas that they normally would have been used. Things like light pollution are, are another issue. So we're in a city, so and that 
I get confused the needles because the needles are nocturnal. They only come out at night. And if it's bright, that makes them want to stay in their burrows. Right. And it can also confuse them and, and cause cause to certainly the biggest would be the uh, chaos. Um so on the same time you when you're speaking, you're, you're doing uh, the research that you said that the focus of the dams are essential. We do require uh, that electricity, we use it all day, every day, but it is about those ultimate routes, an ultimate way for the eels to complete their life cycle safely. Yeah, and we let the eels tell us right. about these different pathways, and so maybe I'll show you a couple tags that we use in our, our research. So, you might wonder, how do we study an eel, right? I can just sit here and look <laughs> out, I, I, I don't see any eel. So how do we let eels tell us about the paths they choose and how do we figure out how many live and how they how many die or the habitats they use and so what we'll do is we'll catch eel and then we'll put different tags in so this is a tag that sends out signals that we can and this is a big tag for the adults we also have a tag that we can put in the small so that we can put in the uh, smaller life stage like the glass eels or the and then we're able to tag them now. So when a tag, when a fish has a tag, we need a path here. We can tag them. So we have a tracking device. Of course. Oh my goodness. Okay, here we go. So, <laughs> here's, my, here's my tracking device. Here's the antenna. If you want to hold that. I got it. So, when a fish that has a tag in it swims by, it would be Here, here's the path it's taking. I know how long it took to swim past. I know whether it made it past the dam or not. So we spend a lot of time tracking fish. This is called radio telemetry uh, with these these tags. That's one of the main ways that we study eel. So they're telling you what alternate routes are working best for them. Exactly. All right. Uh, so Chris, uh, tons of questions. How long does it take for a baby eel to reach maturity? Ooh, good question. Yeah. It, between 15 and, and 20 years. Uh, so we call them uh, yellow eels when they are in lakes and rivers eating and growing. Um, but they're, they're pretty slow slow um, at, at growth, you know. Uh, a lot of fish grow much more quickly than eel. Uh, but eel are, are pretty slow growers. So uh, it's, and they, sh they only reproduce once. That's the other thing. They basically, they grow until they're 20, 25 years old, and then they turn silver, and that's when they migrate out to the Sargasso Sea. But they only do it once. Once they reproduce, they die. So every eel is going, you know, a good life for an eel is to grow big, go to the Sargasso Sea, make babies, and die. It's what, a, it's what eels do. Uh, that's, their, that's their life cycle. And then those, when they die, those nutrients help to feed and fuel the babies as they develop in the, uh, in the ocean. These are some really good questions. Christine, are there any more? There is questions. Um, can we just ask everyone to put questions in that are relevant? Oh, just a reminder that this morning we are talking about the American eel. I did see a few questions regarding the sturgeon. Uh, that was yesterday's topic. Uh, we're going to be sending out an email answering those. Um, and if we could keep the Padlet for questions rather than comments, I know how cool this stuff is. Believe me, I know. Uh, so, is that a uh, little tag like the microchip in my pet dog? That's a really good question. Yeah. Are, the, uh, are the little tags uh, going into small or large eels? Are they like the microchips in our cats and dogs at home? Right, so this one is exactly one of those. So this is the same kind of microchip that's put in uh, a cat or a dog. This tag can't be detected using that. I have a different tool for, for, for tracking these animals uh, and we have to be closer to them. So I can't stand on the shoreline mm -hmm. and follow the little eels. We have to put out uh, the antennas that the, the fish swim past. Uh, yeah, little little microchips. Christine, anything else? 
Oh, so, goodness gracious. Yeah, we mentioned, uh, I mentioned before fishing. And so that is one of the, the factors that did contribute to early declines in the populations. But fishing, targeted fishing for American eels is quite uncommon now because they are so few, it's not profitable. And in fact, in Ontario, we pay commercial fishers to go out, collect eels, they're put into trucks, they bring them back to shore alive in traps, they put them in trucks, and then they actually drive the fish around the dams. <laughs> the adult fish to help get them past the dams to help them get back to the Sargasso Sea. So that is not normal. That tells you how poorly doing, uh, how poorly the eel populations are doing when we have to pay people to catch them, put them in a truck, and drive them past the dams. That is expensive. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of effort. But every eel matters. We're at the point where where every eel matters now, and so that's the the lengths to which we're going to to try and and save the eel populations. Mm -hmm. And it's not just trying to keep the one percent. We want to build it back up. We want to restore those populations. And so uh, there's hatchery programs now as well. Um, and it's usually the hydropower companies that are paying for this work. So uh, the hydro, the dams have been implicated in the declines, and so now the hydropower companies are trying to help uh, help restore those populations. Um, now, I actually have a question for you. Uh, you mentioned that we're standing in this significant place, significant to Indigenous peoples uh, here in the Ottawa region. Uh, the American eel was also significant, significant to those First Nations people. Absolutely. So certainly for food, uh, eel are pretty oily. If you were to eat an, an eel, they've got pretty, uh, they're fairly oily. So they're really dense in nutrients. So really a healthy food source, just like it, um, uh, indigenous peoples in British Columbia would eat Pacific salmon and other fairly oily fish. So those are, are important for nutrition. Uh, they also have a lot of cultural meaning. And in fact, the, there's a transit station just over there and it's called Pim Pimacy. And Pimacy is the indigenous, uh, the, the Algonquin word for American eel. Again, just emphasizing the importance of eel. And that transit station is just by the Canadian War Museum, just, just over that way, um, is actually inspired. The design is inspired by eel, and there's a lot of eel art in there, uh, indigenous eel art, which is pretty cool. So just showing you that connection back to culture. So it wasn't just about food. It played into their, uh, their spirituality uh, and, uh, and cultural practices. Are they omnivores or carnivores? Oh, very good question. Are the American eels omnivores? They are carnivores. They'll eat most anything but small things. So even though an eel might get to be a meter long, its mouth is still pretty tiny. So they will eat small fish. They will eat frogs. They will eat crayfish. They love crayfish. Uh, little invertebrates that, that are crawling around on the on the bottom. So they have to eat a lot of little things to grow big. Oh. And how many types of eels are there in the Great Lakes system? Oh, very good One. question. The American eel. So there's the only fish that we have here in uh, in fresh that spends time in fresh water that is an eel is the American eel, which is the endangered one. Some people get confused with the lamprey. So the lamprey are another sort of long snake-like fish, but the lamprey are an invasive fish that are in the Great Lakes, and they're a parasite. So, uh, and that's actually another one of the problems. People will catch eel, and they'll be afraid of them. They'll think it's a snake. They'll think it's the lamprey, and they'll be concerned about uh, about it. Mm -hmm. And they, instead of taking good care of it and releasing it if they were to catch it, they might actually kill it, throw it up on the shore, not treat it very well. So a lot of the time, a, a lot of our efforts are trying to convince people that eel are cool, <laughs> eel need our help, and they're different from lamprey. From the invasive sea lamprey. Um, okay, perfect. So I'll actually just uh, mention, yesterday um, we were at the aquatarium, and I asked, you know, what can we, as kind of citizens of the Great Lakes region, what can we do to make a difference? And that was the answer, to educate ourselves what are native species that belong, that we need to protect, what are invasive species that we maybe need to work to eradicate, and you know that knowledge and knowing the difference is very powerful. And I'd like to ask you that question actually for our students who are watching. I know they care deeply about the environment. Yep. When it comes to the American eel, 
Is there anything that they can do on a personal level to, to help? Uh, like one of the big things is realizing that wherever there is fresh water, there are fish. And so even though you know, we could stand here all day and look in the water, we are not going to see a fish. But I can assure you, there's lots of fish out there. Uh, they are cryptic, they hide, they're hidden from us. So that's why I love fish, they're mysterious. Uh, I'm In many ways, I'm a fish detective, trying to figure out what they do. Even trying to figure out where do they go, what do they eat, how big do they get? Those are not easy questions to answer when it comes to fish. So for me, I try and get everybody excited about the mysteries of the, the watery world where fish live. And so whenever you see water, just because you don't see life, doesn't mean there aren't fish there. So if you, you know, next time you're walking along and you see somebody throw a, a pop can in the water or, you know, dump some uh, some oil in or want to change the, the shoreline habitat, it's a perfect time to speak up for fish because they can't speak for themselves and let people know that there are fish there, that they are important. Uh, fish are really important for food. Fish are important for uh, um, health. Uh, in fact, uh, we use a lot of fish uh, for research on trying to solve things like uh, human health problems, like cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the, the cultural component. Um, the, the How fish make me feel. It makes me feel good knowing that I can swim in water where it's healthy enough for fish populations. I also like to go fishing. I put most of the fish I catch back. Sometimes I'll, I'll eat them as well. But fish also bring me pleasure in, in that sense as well. Absolutely. I know that on this team, we're all fish fans. Uh, and Christine, sorry, you're trying to get my attention with a great question. Um, how much pollution goes into the water every day? And can you talk about pollution and its effect on eels? Here in the Ottawa River specifically? Yes. Yeah. So pollution is everywhere. It, when it, it rains or snows, there's pollution in, in that. There's, of course, the runoff from our houses and, and roads and, and so on. There's all sorts of pollutions. There's all sorts of nasty chemicals, but there's other forms of pollution. So I mentioned light pollution. Okay? Mm. Nobody's, light isn't a chemical. Light is a, a physical property, and, and that light shines down on the river and can distract the fish. Noise. So there's the noise that can come from the roads, that can come from city life. And that can disturb fish as well. And then we, of course, have uh, the, the, the thermal pollution, which is a fancy way of saying the, the warming. So we have climate change, and with that comes warmer waters. And that's an important form of pollution as well. And then the last one I want to mention is silt. So here's some, this is, this is gravel, but this, this muddy stuff here is silt. And mm. so when it rains, we get silt and mud washing off into our, our rivers. And some of that is natural, but when we develop properties, when we take away the vegetation, more of that silt washes into the water and it smothers the areas where these animals eat and, and live and, and where some fish reproduce, this, not where the, the eel reproduce, way off in the, in the ocean. Uh, so those are the kinds of pollution that I focus on and they are everywhere. So you cannot find uh, you know, a, a place in this planet that isn't affected by pollution in some way. And this is one area where we can all make a difference. Uh, and making sure that, that any time that we generate pollution, uh, that we make sure that it doesn't get released into the environment. Um, okay, I think we have, okay. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like we will have to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much for your questions. Those that we weren't able to answer, we will be responding to by email. Um, so thank you so much for your interest in this incredible topic. Thank you, Dr. Cook, for being with us this morning and sharing uh, the work that you're doing to protect the American eel. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we will come at you again, same time, 11 a.m. tomorrow, <laughs> weather permitting, from Science North in Sudbury. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.